Uh, I'm Lawrence Aiblin, I'm the Dean of the Business School, and I've recently arrived to the University of Adelaide, and uh, I very much uh, want to extend my welcome to all of you uh, for coming this morning to listen to this important talk and discussion. Um, it looks like we have a very good turnout, and uh, I know it's quite early, and, uh, and so we have a very special guest uh, that we're very delighted to welcome uh, here to the University of Adelaide, uh, Paul Bloxham, uh, who is the Chief Economist for HSBC in Australia and New Zealand. And in this role, he is the Chief Spokesperson for HSBC on forecasts and trends for both the Australian and New Zealand economies, so quite a very important role, and their interaction with uh, the global financial markets and international economies. So there's probably uh, no end to Paul's work day. My guess, if, uh, if that is the case, you probably are working 24-7, given the timing of the markets around the world. Uh, Paul's also a critical member of the HSBC Global Research Team, uh, working with 500 analysts uh, across 87 markets to help formulate HSBC's unique uh, global view of the world's economy. Uh, and then just briefly prior to joining HSBC, uh, Paul was an economist with Reserve uh, Bank of Australia's Economic uh, Analysis Department, uh, where he headed up the uh, overseas economies and financial conditions sections, uh, as well as worked on uh, domestic uh, forecasting and pricing. Uh, Paul is an adjunct professor at Curtin University and a member of the Australian National University's Shadow uh, Reserve Bank Board uh, and holds a master's degree in public financial policy from uh, one of the great institutions, the London School of Economics. So again, delighted to welcome you, Paul. Thank you so much. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here and thank you very much for that introduction. It's a great pleasure to see all of you here. It's also a great pleasure to see a very large group of students. I don't remember that undergraduate activities used to start at this time in the morning. Maybe they do now. The world has gotten tougher. But thank you very much for everyone for, for coming along. How does this... Is this a little bit loud? Is it, is it okay? I might see if I turn it down just a little bit. So it certainly is a very busy job, um, this, this job covering Australia's, uh, the Australian and New Zealand economy for HSBC. And as you rightly pointed out, it's very much the case that this is a very international job. I spend a lot of time both travelling internationally to talk about Australia and New Zealand, but also absorbing information from a 24-hour cycle of what happens in terms of global markets. And one of the things I think that's probably most important about this job actually as a macroeconomist, both for my client base and in terms of the public role that I, that I play, is to try and separate what's noise from what's signal. Because if you keep in mind, of course, every day and every minute you've got one of these things sitting in your pockets, and one of these phones sitting in your pockets that provides you with news, apparently, or apparent news. It's information. And it's very hard to know which bits of that information are going to be important for the macroeconomy and which bits are going to be less important. And I think one of the things that helps you to work out what's important and what's not is to take it back to a macroeconomic framework, to be able to apply a macroeconomic framework to the world and say, well, actually, this event is probably not going to have a big effect on Australia or it's not going to have a big effect on this particular financial market. But this set of events, there's risk building here and this is much more what you need to keep your eye on. And you wouldn't be surprised, perhaps, or maybe you would, that market participants even can get distracted by small amounts of noise, things that add volatility, when in actual fact the big, big picture story is over here, and the big picture story continues to play on. So, to my mind, that's one of the big things that an economist ought to be doing. And so you'll probably see in the set of slides that I've got, and in the conversation that I have with you, that it's, I tend to take a fairly long-run view, a fairly big picture view, it's about a sort of broad context of history and what is happening right now and putting it against that broad context to work out which bits are important and which bits are not so important. So it's fair to say that Australia has done really well in recent years and I think that's probably particularly uh, within the Australian economy itself and in the domestic media and in the domestic commentary perhaps understated. Australia has done phenomenally well 
Our economy, if you look at the broadest metric, GDP, over the past uh, five years has grown by 14%. If you compare that with the United States, the US economy, despite the enormous amount of stimulus that they've delivered, they've, got, they've delivered fiscal stimulus, they've, got, uh, they've cut their interest rates to zero and then they had to do more, so they've been adding to the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, what's referred to as quantitative easing. They've delivered everything they could get to throw at the economy to get it to grow, and it's only grown by 7% over the past five years. But that's impressive in the scheme of things when you compare it to the rest of the world because the European economy has actually shrunk by 1% over the past five years. Five years have gone by and the, new, and the European economy is actually 1% smaller than it was. The British economy is just starting to recover now. It's 1% larger than it was five years ago. But in the context of that, Australia's performance is stellar. We've done very, very well. And why have we done so well? Well, in large part, we've done so well because we've had very strong ties to Asia and to China. The Chinese economy is 60% larger than it was five years ago. So for all of the talk there is, and there is a lot of talk about the idea that Australia has become very tied to China and potentially is overly reliant on Chinese growth, uh, this, in the scheme of things, actually China is the main reason why Australia has done so well through that period of time. And indeed, it's probably the main reason why I am still relatively optimistic about Australia's growth prospects. Even though the mining story is slowing down, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment, the, the Australian economy still has very strong ties to one of the fastest growing economies in the world in the form of China. And China, on average, is still poor. China has been converging. Its living standards have been lifting. And of course, it's been growing very quickly. But on average, GDP per capita is still fairly low. As you will all know, those who study macroeconomics, there's this process of catch-up as countries catch up to the technological frontier. Well, China's still a long way behind that technological frontier. There's an extraordinary amount of catch-up yet to come. And Australia is very fortunate to be very tied to this part of the world. It's very fortunate that Australia is tied to Asia, tied to China, and not, unfortunately, like the British, for example, who are very tied to Europe. Europe is the old world. Europe has got some enormous challenges. Those challenges are going to go on for probably the next decade and maybe longer. They've got lots of challenges that will mean that their growth will be slow. And even though, the, and so with, with a slow growing trading partner, Britain has got far less, a far less optimistic outlook, in my view, uh, than the Australian economy has at the moment. So, what are the big stories at the moment? What's going on right now? Well, the big story for 2013 was all about watching the Federal Reserve. After six years of the Federal Reserve and the US loosening policy, trying to support its economy after the global financial crisis arrived in 2008, uh, after it had spent six years loosening policy settings. Around the middle of last year, Ben Bernanke got up on a box and said, you know, when the economy starts to improve, we're not going to keep buying all these assets in the market, and actually monetary policy might just have to start moving in the other direction. It was the first hint that the markets had had in six years that actually the Federal Reserve was considering moving its policy instrument the other way. They've delivered an enormous amount of stimulus. Interest rates got to zero not long after the global financial crisis began, and the Federal Reserve started stacking assets onto its balance sheet, buying assets in the market, quantitative easing, in order to pour it back into the banking system and hope that the banks would lend it to the rest of the economy and that that would lift growth. Of course, it's, it's been a long and slow and sluggish recovery in terms of the US economy, but we got to May last year and Ben Bernanke, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, decided actually this is the point in time where they might consider starting to move in the other direction. Now, from a macroeconomic perspective, as, an, as a macroeconomist observing this, I thought to myself, this is not big news. Surely everyone must believe that when the, when the US economy starts to recover, the Fed's going to start withdrawing stimulus. But to the markets, this was enormous news. This was huge. Market interest rates, the 10-year bond rate was at 1.6%. Extraordinarily low in the scheme of things. The world was prepared to lend to the US economy at 1.6% per annum for, for 10 years which is a very low interest rate in the scheme of things. Why? Because they believed the US economy was going to have a long period of, of, of weaker conditions. Well, Ben Bernanke getting up and saying, actually, we think things are starting to improve, meant that that 1.6% bond yield went to 3% in six weeks. So it, it went up a lot. And that has a big effect on the global economy. As soon as interest rates rise in the US, what tends to happen is capital flows back to the US, because it's still seen as the deepest, most liquid, safest market. And that's what we saw. That's those, those bond yields rose to 3%. Along the way, of course, tightening of monetary conditions in the US, some, sen some sense that the Fed is going to start to withdraw, had big ramifications for the rest of the world. There was a whole range of countries that had gotten very used to the idea that capital was cheap. 
that they could get capital, foreign capital, and they could invest it in their economy, and they could, they could get that capital very easily. The world was being flooded by, with liquidity by the Federal Reserve. So the Ben Bernanke suggesting he was going to change directions, or even hinting that there were some direction changes coming, at bond yields go from 1.6% to 3%, a whole range of economies across the world that had become very reliant on this foreign capital started to have some big problems. Brazil, South Africa, Turkey, India, Indonesia. What we're calling at the moment the fragile five. Countries that have got very large current account deficits, and as you know, that implies that they've got large foreign capital reliance, so a lot of capital flowing in, suddenly saw that with that capital dry up. Their currencies fell dramatically uh, around the middle of last year, and so they all had to start thinking, well, what are, gonna, what are we going to do? What's the first reaction you do? Well, you start lifting interest rates. Because if you lift interest rates in your own domestic economy, the capital doesn't run away as quickly. So these countries started to come under pressure. We get through to the second half of net last year, and the market started to believe, or they had believed, that, that Ben Bernanke had told them it was going to come in September. But in September, they were going to start slowing down this asset purchasing program. Turns out he didn't, he didn't deliver. Not September. You had to wait till December for that to happen. So this range of emerging economies that I've referred to, Brazil, South Africa, Turkey, India, Indonesia, they got a bit of a reprieve. But the Fed did start to taper, did start to slow down its asset purchasing program. So it was buying $85 billion worth of assets in the market every month, started to slow it down from December. And this set of countries then came under pressure again. And so that, to me, was the big story for, for 2013, was watching the Federal Reserve and watching when it was going to start to withdraw the stimulus that it had been delivering to the world economy continually for six years. This year's big story, globally, front page of the Financial Times, is still, and will still, I think, continue to be about watching the Federal Reserve withdraw, watching the US economy gradually recover, and watching what that means, more importantly, for this set of countries, these emerging economies, that have become very reliant on this cheap foreign capital. Brazil, South Africa, Turkey, India, and Indonesia are still very much in the news because their currencies have fallen, they've been under a lot of pressure, they've had been forced to lift interest rates, and that, of course, means their growth is slowing down at the same time. So those countries are, are a big focus for the global news. What's interesting, though, from Australia's perspective is that, of course, these are not big trading partners of Australia's. Australia's two major trading partners are China and Japan. And those two countries, as you might know, have current account surpluses. They are big exporters of capital. They have got their own domestic saving and they use their own domestic saving to grow their economies. And so they are not really subject to this same force of the Fed withdrawing and the withdrawal of Fed money actually meaning that they're, they're, they're potentially under pressure. China and Japan are self-funded. They've got their own savings. Their own stories, though, are interesting in and of themselves. So in China, of course, we know Chinese growth has started to slow down and people have gotten worried because China used to grow at 10%, double-digit rates, and everyone's saying, well, now it's only growing at 7.5%. What are we going to do? My view on that to some degree, and I'll show you some slides in a moment. I will get to some slides in a moment. Um, the, it, my, my view on this is that they are still growing extremely rapidly, and of course China is a much larger economy than it used to be, so it's still a very large contributor to global growth. But the Chinese growth rate is slowing down, and China does face some internal challenges of, it, of, of its own. Its financial system is, is being growing very rapidly. And when a financial system grows very rapidly, you can often get misallocation of capital. Something called the shallow banking system has been very much a topic of discussion in recent times because they've got a banking system, but the banking system is very well regulated, very highly regulated. And so a lot of the activity for people looking for more return has started to form outside of the, shadow, outside of the bank, banking system in something called the shadow banking system. And a lot of risk is built up there. And so a few of these loans that are on the shadow, in the shadow banking system have started to fall over. And probably more of them are going to fall over yet. And it's a bit opaque, so people don't quite know what it means and how it's going to play out. But in the scheme of things, it's still a fairly small story. China is still able to grow. The Chinese authorities have a big challenge, though. They are trying to open up their financial system and still continue to grow their economy at 7 or 7.5% 7 without seeing a collapse. And so that's a big focus for this year's story. My view, the House view in the HSBC, is that China has got it largely under control. They're going to be able to continue to grow quickly, which is, very, which is a fundamentally important story for Australia. Just briefly on Japan, before I try and use some of the many slides I've got with me, um, Japan has got an interesting story as well. Because back in December of 2012, uh, they elected Shinzo Abe, who is their new Prime Minister, on a platform of getting Japan out of its long funk. Japan had had two lost decades. 
Japan had had 13 years of deflation. And Shinzo Abe was elected saying, we're going to put in place three different strategies for getting a, a, the Japanese economy to lift, for getting inflation to rise. The first is, we're going to do what the Fed did. We're going to get the Bank of Japan to pump liquidity into the Japanese system. That's going to put some downward pressure on the yen. That pumping liquidity into the banking system is going to flow through to the economy and we hope it's going to lift things. The Bank of Japan is, is planning to pump more liquidity into the system, more liquidity into the Japanese system than the Federal Reserve is in their third quantitative easing program, in, so in terms of yen being pumped into the system. It's an enormous quantitative easing program. The second strategy that he had in mind was he was going to boost fiscal spending. They were going to build more roads, more bridges, and more, more infrastructure, and they've already done that to some degree. And the third was he wanted to put in place structural reforms to deal with the fact that their labour market has become less flexible, their services sector is not very, is, has got low productivity. These are issues that Shinzo Abe was, was, was seeking to deal with. Well, the first two he's delivered. He's pumped prime the economy full of, full of cash, and the public sector is starting to spend a whole lot more. And Japanese growth has started to lift. We now have inflation in Japan. Uh, we've had persist the highest rate of inflation in 13 years. It's almost hitting the Bank of Jan Japan's target at this stage. So this is an important story for Australia because our two major trading partners are actually doing, are actually seeing their growth do okay. We're actually tied to two countries which are not reliant on that Fed story and are very much continuing to grow. And indeed, Japan, I think, has got a fair bit of upside in the scheme of things. What does this mean for Australia? Well, Australia, of course, has had a massive amount of mining investment going on in, its, in the country and had our own uh, had our own uh, our own challenges. And that is, as that mining investment starts to fall, which is already happening. What is going to take over as a driver of growth? And again, for, from my own perspective, we've been fairly optimistic. Our view is the bulk of the Australian economy is outside of the resources sector, and the bulk of the Australian economy is quite sensitive to where interest rates are. The RBA has managed to keep inflation under control, so it's been able to cut interest rates at the right time to try and get the rest of the economy to start to pick up. And we're seeing some signs that that's already happening. So I have lots of slides, and you'll probably get very excited about my slides. I hope you do. Um, I've had, I have about 55 slides. I'm not going to go through 55 slides. There's no way that I carry way more slides than I need. I'm going to pick and choose the ones that I think are most pertinent to make some of the supporting, uh, to, to be able to support some of the points that I've already made and to add some new ones along the way. Um, and then I'm going to make sure also that I leave plenty of time for questions because certainly from my perspective, the most interesting part of this is also to get some feedback from you as to what you're interested in talking about. And, uh, of course, it has to be the macro economy. I know nothing about sport. Um, so these are the sort of six themes I wanted to touch on. Um, and I'm going to flip through a couple of slides for each of these themes. First, the pickup in the global economy. Um, pick, there's a pickup in global growth expected for 2014. But as I said, we think it's going to be led by the US. We think the US economy is starting to lift. The Federal Reserve is starting to withdraw. And that's something worth keeping in mind. Um, the, the second thing is that Australia has had two booms that have been supporting its long boom. Okay? Australia's long boom, we've had 23 years of continuous GDP growth in this country. It's been driven by two things. In the early part of the, early, in, in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, it was led by a ramp up in housing credit, a ramp up in leverage, something that happened across the rest of the developed world as well. Financial markets got deeper, households took on more debt, house prices rose, and we went through this transition from low debt, lower household debt levels to higher household debt levels in moving in terms of the, in the transition from one state to the other. Uh, households were able to spend a bit more, and that was one of the key drivers of growth back then. Fortunately for us, that period came to an end in about 2003 and was neatly taken over by a mining investment or a mining boom. Commodity prices ramped up a lot, they got to very high levels and motivated a large amount of investment in the resources sector. Both of those stories, in large part, are now at their end. We're not going to see another ramp up in household debt levels that are already fairly high in Australia. We're not going to see commodity prices continue, continue to rise continually. Commodity prices look as though they've peaked. So we've got some other challenges. We have to deal with the fact that those two forces in terms of our growth are now in the past. There's something else that needs to come along and support our growth. I have a fair bit of optimism about this story and what I've been describing is we need a third boom. And the reason I have optimism is because we, as I said earlier, we are very much tied to the Asian economies, very much tied to China. China, we still think, is going to continue to grow fairly quickly. And of course, China is still poor on average, which means we are still in the position where China's 
got to see that transition as it gets wealthier and it's going to change its spend, the, the people in China are going to change their spending behaviour. It's not just going to be all about iron ore and coal and LNG, it's going to be about services. They're going to buy more tourism services, they're going to buy more business services, more education services. And I think those sorts of things are areas where Australia still has many, many opportunities to take advantage of the growth in Asia. We are still highly tied to the parts of the global economy that are growing most quickly. The third theme is one, of course, that is important, and that is the resources sector and what's been going on there. The resources sector is slowing down. But I emphasise, and I really do emphasise this, we don't think it's going to be mining boom followed by mining bust. We think it's going to be that the resources sector has, has, has ramped up and is levelling out as a share of the economy. Or another way to think about it is growth has been very strong and it's slowing down, but we don't think we're going to see a fall in mining GDP. Why? Because we've been doing a lot of investment and that investment's been for a reason. It's been so that you could see a ramp up in our exports and that's what's happening. The resources sector story is going from being an investment-led story to an export-led story. And as it does that, you're, st you're still going to see overall GDP in the mining sector. The overall contribution to economic activity is going to continue to rise. So it's not a drag on growth, but it's going to grow a lot more slowly. If it grows a lot more slowly, of course, if the overall economy is going to grow, you're going to need the other parts to pick up. And that's exactly what the RBA has in mind. They've cut their cash rate from 475 down to 2.5%. They've got interest rate settings that are very loose. Monetary policy is as loose as it's been in at least 40 years at this point in time. And it's starting to have an effect, which leads us to the fourth point, which is that growth is starting to rebalance. We're starting to see, we've seen a pickup in the housing market. We're seeing a pickup in the housing construction cycle. Uh, we're seeing a pickup in retail sales. So the consumer is starting to do a bit more spending in the scheme of things. Growth is shifting from being led by mining investment, as it has been in recent years, to being led more broadly by other parts of the economy, in part because interest rates are low, and also because the Aussie dollar has started to come down. The fifth theme, and I may or may not get there, given the amount of time I'm taking up so far to get through my introductory slide, um, the fifth theme is that the third boom, we, we still think that there are lots of opportunities for Australia and we think they mostly come from our strong connections to Asia. And I will try and get there because there's a few interesting points about where we think the prospects are in the medium term. And the sixth is one that everyone's aware of. We do face some challenges. Productivity growth has been weak in recent years. Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have a lack of competitiveness, particularly in some areas uh, that we need to focus on and these remain quite large policy challenges. As I said, I'm going to skip a few. So I'm going to point to some of the ones that are my favourites, although I must say that I didn't bring any of the ones I don't like very much. So this is all of my favourites. Um, this is a chart of GDP growth. It's a global story. So it's um, China, the United States and Japan. And it goes back to 1990. But it's unlike charts you might have seen on growth before. What you tend to see is graphs show GDP growth in percentage terms. Now, that's all very sensible to do that, but it doesn't give a sense when you compare percentage point changes uh, across countries of the scale of what's going on. This chart is different. It shows growth in GDP in the United States, China, and Japan, but it shows it in US dollar terms. So it's the additional increment each year you're getting to those economies because they're growing uh, in terms of US dollar value. So what does it do? Well, it actually multiplies, if you think about it this way, it multiplies the percentage change by the size of the economy. And that's an important point to make, and that's what this chart does. So this goes back to 1990. So there's a couple of points. The first is Japan was growing extremely rapidly in the, in the early 1990s, and indeed, because it was a large economy, it was actually contributing more than the United States, which is quite phenomenal. But of course, we know how that game ends. We've seen how it plays out. Japan also had a very mass, a massive asset price bubble that burst, and when it did, uh, its economy slowed down, and indeed that grey line averages zero over that period of time. So Japan hasn't done very well in the scheme of things. It's been volatile, it's had cycles, but it really hasn't grown over that period of time. The United States in the mid-1990s and early 2000s was the largest contributor to global GDP growth. Why? Because it was the largest economy and it was growing quite quickly as well. It was growing at an average of about 25 to 3%, which doesn't sound phenomenally large, but because it was the largest economy in the world, it was contributing the most. That black line was the biggest amongst these, these three, three major economies. China, by comparison, even though back in the, the 1990s and 2000s it was growing at 9 or 10 percent, because it was actually a fairly small economy in the scheme of things, it wasn't contributing much to overall GDP growth. That red line is a whole lot smaller back in the 90s and the early 2000s 
than the black line for the United States, because of course China's, even though it's growing quickly, it was a fairly small economy in the scheme of things. But we know that if you grow at 10% per annum, we all know the rule of sevens, right? If you divide 70 by the growth rate, it tells you how quickly, uh, how, how long it takes to double in size, okay? It's the rule of sevens, basic exponents. If you were growing at 10% per annum, then you double in size every seven years. And China was growing at 10% per annum on average, so it was doubling in size every seven years. The rule of exponents made it a much larger economy very, very quickly. Um, and of course, what we saw is that red line accelerated very quickly. Even though China was still growing at the same pace, it was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So China actually overtook the United States to be the largest contributor uh, to global GDP growth after the global financial crisis began. Why? For two reasons. One, the US had a recession, so it fell and its growth slowed down. And two, China, it wasn't that China necessarily accelerated as much as China was becoming just much larger than it was. So what does this mean? Well, China, for the last six years, has been the largest contributor, single contributor to global GDP growth. And China's growth now is slowing down, right? Everyone talks about the idea that China's slowing down from double-digit rates of 10% to closer to 7 or 7.5. 7 7.5 is what the authorities are targeting for this year, and everyone's getting worried. Well, it's not necessarily something you should worry as much about, is the view that I've got, because China is just a whole lot bigger. Those red lines are going to stay fairly high. Those forecasts are for 7.5 7 and 7.7% 7 .7 growth. But it's going to continue to be a very large contributor to overall GDP growth, even though it's slowing down, because, of course, it's just a much larger economy than it used to be. So it's important to keep in mind that China is still, even though it's slowing down, a very large contributor to the overall story, because China is getting bigger. That's a very important for a story for Australia because 35% of our exports, 35% go to China. The China story is a, is a very big one for Australia. China has got a long way to, grow, to, to go yet, and that's the other part of the story. So there's still a lot more growth yet to come. I talked about this earlier on. I said that China's got to catch up. Well, this is one way to look at this story. This is one way to look at a comparison across about the level of GDP per capita, the level of income per, per person in those various economies. And really, when you put it up like this, it, it, I think it's quite a stunning story. So I've got five uh, countries on this chart, and you can see the black line is the United States, so the technological leader, uh, and you can see China is the red line. Back in the 80s and 90s, you can barely see it's different from zero. This is per capita GDP, per person GDP. Japan, uh, sorry, China, China's growth has picked up and of course China has started to catch up to the rest of the world. It's headed towards the same sorts of levels, but it is extraordinarily low when you compare it to the developed world. There's still a long way to go in terms of its GDP per capita. As, of course, its GDP per capita rises, you will see a shift. It will go from being a country that is in, uh, agricultural and subsistence to urbanised and industrialised, and as it does that, of course, it needs to build roads and bridges and houses. It needs to use, start using a lot more energy. And that's the phase we're in right now. We're in the phase where China is ramping up in terms of its demand for iron ore, for coal, for energy, uh, for, 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 for energy and for, for hard commodities. Because, of course, it's building all of those, all of those various... Um, it's building all that infrastructure. Uh, but, of course, China is still... It's building that infrastructure, but it's still got to do the next stage, which is uh, where, the, where the households in, in China start to consume more services where they start to have improved diets, where they move from eating grains to eating more meats and more dairy. And these sorts of things are likely to be opportunities for Australia. There's one other thing I'd make on this, or there's two other things I'd make from this chart. The first is India is still a long way off. There's still a long way to go for India. India's barely gotten started. And when India does take off, and I don't think it's quite going to happen in the next couple of years, but I do think it's a story that's out there in the horizon. Sometime in perhaps five or ten years' time, India really starts to take off. Um, when they do get their reform agenda together, India's got a long way to go in terms of converging. And of course the Indian population is almost as large as the Chinese population, so when that does start to happen, I think it will be a very big story. There's another line on this chart, of course, and that is Australia. And this uh, chart actually really does illustrate just how well Australia has done in recent years. Not only have we grown, so our per capita GDP has been growing, but of course our exchange rate has also appreciated. So we have gone from a, an exchange rate that was close to 46 cents back in, the, back in the early 2000s to a peak of 110, and now we're sitting at 90 cents. Um, of course, a doubling in the exchange rate means, of course, our GDP per capita in US dollar terms has risen. Now, there are lots of different ways to measure this, and I am co cognizant that we can do it in purchasing power parity terms as well, 
But that's uh, the, the idea that I'm trying to put forth is mostly about the idea that there's convergence going on. You can show the same chart, PPP, and it actually shows the same story. And the previous chart, the idea was to show just the increment that's delivered to global demand in US dollar terms because, of course, that's how it shows up in terms of the demand for things like Australia's commodities. So I'm, if, if people want to take me, take me up on the PPP issue, I can, we can have a chat about that afterwards. But I did this quite, um, quite, quite purposefully and, and, and considering whether I would use one or the other as, a, as, as an idea. Um, I've got a lot of slides here. I want to touch on just a set of the global themes that we've got in mind for 2014. And then I want to move a little bit on to showing some pictures about the resources sector and commodity prices. And then I want to get a little bit onto Australia, and I've got probably about 10 to 15 minutes to get all that done and still have some time for questions for you guys. So very quickly on the 14 themes, because those are things I've largely touched on anyway. The first is the Chinese economy. It's a year of reform for China. That's the way we're looking at it. They are, their economy is slowing down a bit, and they, what they are really focused on is trying to get their financial system, opening up their financial system to the rest of the world. It's happening actually quite quickly because they face some pretty big challenges, but in our view they're focused on quality of growth rather than quantity of growth. They're, they're aware that they're not trying to get their economy to grow back, to, to grow again at 8 or 9 or 10 percent. It will slow down. It's become a much larger economy than it used to be. But they're very focused on making sure that they don't have any bumps in the road, that effectively their financial system doesn't misallocate along the way and they don't have to have a significant downturn to correct for previous issues. So they are very focused, the authorities, on, on the quality of their growth. We can talk about that more in questions if you'd like. Japan is still transforming. Um, transforming in the sense that the Ar Arbonomics, the thing I talked about earlier, has just been delivered and we're still yet to see what that means. Its growth is lifting but it's a question as to whether it will be sustained. Another part of this story for Japan that's pretty important is that as the Bank of Japan is pumping liquidity into the J Japanese financial system, it's not all going to stay in Japan. Some of it's going to flow offshore and that's what that offshore flows are expected story means. Some of that capital is going to eke into the rest of Asia and into Australia as well. The United States, well, I haven't talked much about the US, but I think the US is on a modest road to recovery. Of course, the recovery from the global financial crisis has been long and drawn out, and its economy is still, um, it's only just recovering, but we do think that things are picking up to some degree in the US, enough to allow the Federal Reserve to continue to slow down its asset purchasing program through this year, and perhaps by next year, they're even considering lifting interest rates. And again, we can talk about that a bit more. That's a big topic, by the way, of, of conversation when I travel the world. Everyone wants to know what HSBC's view is on the US and when interest rates are going to rise, because US interest rates are still a very, very large, uh, uh, have, still have a very large effect on global financial markets. In fact, probably the largest. Asia, rates matter more than exports uh, in the sense that the withdrawal of capital that the Federal Reserve is delivering in terms of their tapering their quantitative easing program matters for the Asian economies as well, but it doesn't matter for China and Japan. And that is my point for Australia in the scheme of things. Politics is also important. I won't go there for the moment because I'll run out of time. India, India's growth is stabilising. We do think that there are better prospects in terms of their reform agenda having picked up pace to some degree, but it's still weak in the scheme of things. I haven't mentioned Europe. Europe is stabilised. It's a bit better but not good enough in the scheme of things because European growth we think will be a little under 1% this year and indeed I think Europe is going to be in a long period of adjustment that's going to mean that their economy doesn't contribute a lot to the increment of global demand. Um, Brazil, the World Cup will not be enough. <laughs> they have the World Cup this year but Brazil is almost in recession at the moment. Brazil has had a significant downturn. They didn't manage the run-up in commodity prices quite as well as Australia did and actually it's an interesting test case as to why and how that happened but essentially the Brazilian economy has slowed down a lot. People will have heard of something called the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India and China. In the end it turned out that the story is really not BRICS, it's, a, it's, it's, it's C. Because China is the one that's growing, Brazil of course is slowing down, Russia has got some very lar fairly large challenges as well that we can talk about if you, if you want to, but you're probably full aware, fully aware they're front page news at the moment. Uh, and India, its reform agenda just hasn't kept pace with the amount of potential that it's got. So, Australia. Let's talk a little bit about Australia. As I said at the beginning, Australia's performance has been very strong. Undeniably strong. We've had 23 years of continuous GDP growth in Australia. This is a feat unmatched in our history. It's a feat unmatched by any other OECD economy over the last 23 year period. So we have done very well. This red line, year-ended growth in GDP, has stayed above zero now 
for 23. We're in our 23rd year of it being above zero. And indeed, we expect that it will continue to grow this year. The signs are positive for this story. So we have done very well in recent times. A part of this story in recent years, of course, has been we've had a very large mining investment boom. We've had a very, very large run-up in mining investment. Why? Because China started to demand a whole lot more commodities back in the early 2000s, about 2003, 2004, from the rest of the world. We hadn't built a lot of capacity globally to provide those commodities, so the price of those commodities went up a lot. And when the price of those commodities went up a lot, mining companies went, well, that's really good. Okay, let's start investing in a whole lot of capacity to produce these commodities because the price of that good is a lot higher than it used to be and that boosted their profits. So we saw a very large run up in mining investment, which is the bottom chart here. You can see engineering construction has been ramping up uh, and you can see, uh, but you can see obviously that it's gotten to a peak level as well. So mining investment has been ramping up and has been particularly strong, uh, was particularly strong in 2011 and 2012. It started to level out last year and it's going to fall. Why is it going to fall? Because we've just done so much mining investment, it's not possible for us to keep building as many projects, as many large projects as we've been building in recent years. And so we're going to do less of it. There's going to be less mining investment. Mining investment's going to start to fall. But as I always say, and particularly to our client base, I say, we didn't build this capacity for no reason. We built it so that we could switch on the machines and that they would produce more exports, that we'd see more coal, more iron ore, and more LNG exports. And indeed, that's exactly what's happening. That red line in that same chart shows you the exports are starting to ramp up, and there's a lot more to come. The LNG projects we're building in Australia have yet to start to produce anything. They've yet to be switched on. When they do, we get a 3 to 400% rise in LNG exports over the five years from about 2015. So if you add together the exports and the investment, you get the top left panel, which is mining GDP. Mining GDP, um, GDP growth has been very strong in recent years. That's the black line, and you can see black, the black line has been above its 35-year average, which is the dotted line for the past eight years. That's the mining boom. That's one way to capture the mining boom. There's lots of different ways, but this is one way to think about it. Mining GDP has growing, been growing extremely rapidly, particularly in 2011-12 and particularly in 12-13. But it is going to slow down. It's going to slow down a lot because the investment is going to start to fall. But we don't think it's going to fall. We think it's just going to slow down, which means, of course, the rest of the economy needs to pick up to take over as a driver of growth. We need growth to rebalance from being mining investment led to being led by the other parts of the economy. Thankfully, there are some signs that that's already happening. I'm sorry to skip through so many, but um, there are some signs that that's already happening. The housing market is lifting, low interest rates in Australia. The RBA cut its cash rate from a peak of 475. It's now got at 2.5%. Mortgage rates are at their lowest levels uh, in, in 40 years. The cash rate, the RBA's cash rate, is at its lowest level in history. So they've cut interest rates aggressively to try and stimulate the non-mining sectors of the economy, the parts of the economy outside of the resources sector, and indeed they're having some success. House prices are up 10% over the past year. They're up 12% since their trough in May of 2012. And it's not just a house price boom anymore. It's starting to flow through now to a pickup in residential construction as well. So this chart shows two lines. Red line is the level of residential investment in dollar value, and the black line is the number of new approvals for residential investment. And you can see that timely indicator is telling you that dwelling approval, that, that new, new residential construction is going to start to pick up quite strongly in the coming couple of quarters. We think we're going to see the strongest period of dwelling investment in Australia in 12 years, in, 20, in 2014. So growth is shifting from being investment led in the mining sector to being more led by the other parts of the economy, particularly uh, the bits of the economy that are responsive to interest rates. Consumer sentiment is sitting around its average of 100, not particularly exciting, but consumption growth has started to lift a bit. Consumers are starting to open their wallets in response to low interest rates, and we're seeing that will be a force in terms of helping growth rebalance as well. We're also seeing an improvement in business conditions. So this chart is uh, a bit novel. It shows the National Australia Bank measure of business conditions, which is the black line overlaid over GNE. Does anyone know what GNE is? GNE is domestic demand, uh, a measure within the national accounts that measures domestic demand. And I've excluded here, I've excluded engineering investment. So effectively what I've done is tried to get to a non-mining measure of domestic demand, a uh, proxy. The bottom line is the black line tends to have a fairly good relationship with non-mining GDP. Uh, effectively the, the part of the economy that you need to rebalance, the bit that you're watching to see pick up. And it turns out that that red line is starting to lift. 
and the timely indicators are telling you that it should lift a bit further. Growth overall is starting to rebalance in the Australian economy. One of the areas that is still fairly weak in the scheme of things in Australia is the labour market. Employment growth has been weak. In the year to February, we've only created 80,000 jobs, which is actually a pretty small number in the scheme of things. Employment growth has been running at 0.6%. It's been fairly weak. But if you look carefully at all the timely indicators we've got of what's going to happen with hiring, they tell you that things should start to improve fairly soon, that actually we should see an improvement in the labour market in coming months, that that story is starting to play out. So we've seen an improvement in the activity indicators, we've seen an improvement in the housing market, retail sales, and we're starting to see now an improvement in terms of employment. So Australia's prospects, Australia's economy, the cyclical upturn is, is, is swinging, is, 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 has already started. So there's a, just a few more charts I want to touch on and then I want to go to some questions. There was one part of the story at the end, the fifth theme that I wanted to make sure that I got to, and that is Australia's third boom. What's next? What's going to happen? You know, the mining story is slowing down, and although mining GDP is not going to fall, and we think it's still going to contribute, it's a great story in the scheme of things, in my view. We've built a lot of capacity. It's coming online. Those exports are going to ramp up. That's going to be a good source of growth for Australia. But it's going to slow down. Mining GDP is not going to contribute as much as it did previously. So we need something else. What else are we going to benefit from? What is the world going to provide for us? And on this view, I'm actually reasonably optimistic. We are very tied to Asia already. We have strong population ties. 28% of Australia's population was born somewhere else. And the largest inflows that come into Australia come from Asia. That's been happening now since the mid-1980s. The number of Chinese coming to Australia is now more than the number of British. The number of Indians coming to Australia is now more than the number of British. We have very strong population ties. We have very strong trade ties. 65% of our exports go to Asia. So we are very strong in the trade space. And the finance space is growing. It's a very small linkage at the moment, but it is growing. And so taking advantage of those opportunities that Asia is going to offer, in my view, yeah, the thing is the reason why I have optimism that we're going to continue to be able to grow. So there's a few aspects, there's a few areas where I think things have got a lot of prospect. I think firstly, the education sector. It's been under a lot of pressure in recent years, and indeed these are international student enrolments, it's the red line, so this may be close to your heart, some of you who are academics. Um, the this international student enrolments have, been, have fallen since their peak in 2009. For a couple of reasons. One, the Aussie dollar was very high, which made us less competitive. And secondly, I think policy wasn't helpful. Um, after the 2010 election, there was a fair bit of a, there was a cutback in terms of student visa issuance, international student visa issuance, which meant that fewer visas were issued. And then we had some issues also with students from India uh, in, and some, some racial tensions in Melbourne, if you recall. Those, the collection of those factors put some downward pressure, saw, saw these international student enrolments fall. But the Aussie dollar has now come down, the student visa issuance has started to pick up, and we're starting to see those enrolments start to rise as well. I think this area has good prospects. I think as the Asian economies continue to develop, and they want to do more and more of the things that the rest of us do as well, there will be more and more international students seeking to come to Australia. The tourism industry is already seeing a massive change in Australia. There's been a very large compositional change in terms of arrivals. If you go through the airport, and I do this more, more often than I'd like, but if you go through the airport, you know when you come back across international borders, you fill in that little green card, and the green card says, how long are you going to be away, where you've been, what you're here for? Uh, well, this is where the data end up. They end up in the Australian Bureau of Statistics in this particular measure. This is short-term arrivals, and this is effectively a tourist number count, and you can see where people are coming from. Well, there's been extraordinary growth, 85% growth in the past three years in Chinese arrivals into the Australian economy. And that story is set to continue. The Chinese are travelling everywhere. The tourism numbers are rising very, very rapidly. And Australia is going to be, and indeed is already, a beneficiary of that story. Another story that's going on, of course, is, as I said earlier, the Chinese are opening up their financial system rapidly. And it's a key focus of the Chinese authorities to make sure that there is a lot of overseas direct investment, that capital flows offshore from China. This is a picture of overseas direct investment from the Chinese economy. Almost nothing back in 2004, ramping up over the past uh, decade. And indeed, they project it to continue to rise. They are looking to open up their financial system. What does that mean? It means more capital coming abroad. And where is Australia is going to be a beneficiary of that as well. As capital comes into our economy, that's going to make it easier for us to be able to invest. And finally, the agricultural sector. I am reasonably optimistic about this sector for Australia. I think 
As diets change uh, in these emerging economies, in particular in China, as they shift from consuming a lot of grains to consuming more dairy, more meat, more sugar, more edible oils, more of the finer foods, you're going to see that they are going to demand, that you're going to see more of a demand for these sorts of things. So this is animal product consumption, calories per capita per day on the vertical axis, levels of GDP per capita on the horizontal axis. As you move to the right, these countries get richer, and as they get richer, their diets change. They eat more animal products. Well, what does that mean? It means if you're a large producer of those sorts of commodities, meat, dairy, sugar, edible oils, you're likely to be a beneficiary. And Australia, of course, is a large exporter of agricultural commodities. I haven't gotten to the part about government fiscal, the fiscal situation or productivity. Perhaps we can take those in questions, but I do want to make sure that I've got time for questions. So are there any questions from anyone about macroeconomics? Yes? Right, so I would like to ask you about what you think about the future of the financial system changing in Australia. Because the, the offshore iron market may be grow rapidly in Singapore, in Hong Kong, but I do not quite sure about all that happening in Sydney or Melbourne. So what do you think about the federal government will make some change in their system to attract money from China? Oh, that's a really good question um, and, and a really important one. And in fact, right now, um, we've got something called the Murray Review. David Murray, the former head of the Future Fund, and prior, prior to that, he was the CEO of Commonwealth Bank, is running a financial system review to look at how we should try to shift our financial system to better, for it to better serve Australia's growth prospects. And I think there are a couple of key issues that they're looking at, and one of them is how do we mobilise the amount of saving within the Australian economy so that it is better allocated? We've got a very large pool of saving. Our superannuation system, for example, uh, is the fourth largest in the world. We are only the twelfth largest economy in the world, and we're only 1% of global GDP, but we have the fourth largest superannuation system over, over the size of about $1.7, $1.8 trillion worth of superannuation funding. And so a lot of saving, we have a lot of saving, uh, saving pool sitting here. How do we better mobilise that so that it actually gets to things like infrastructure, which we require? But I think another aspect is the one you raised, and this is a very important one. How do we try to make our financial system uh, open enough and, and, and allocative enough to be able to see funds that a lot of saving that's sitting to the north of us up in Asia find the right home in Australia? To my mind, one of the key things that we seem to have in Australia, we have a huge equity market, but we have a fairly small corporate bond market. We don't have an infrastructure bond market at all in Australia. So I would like to see more sort of movements along the lines of trying to find ways to give an incentive for there to be greater corporate bond issuance, for there to be a potential, potentially an infrastructure bond market that forms a, that's a bit deeper because to my mind one of the key things Australia needs right now is better infrastructure. We haven't been building infrastructure, we've got congestion in our major cities, I didn't talk about it, the productivity growth has slowed down in Australia and I think part of the reason for that is a lack of investment in infrastructure. We have a pool of saving in the form of superannuation, but it doesn't seem to be ending up getting very much, much of it doesn't seem to be going back to infrastructure. There's a large pool of savings to the north of us in China uh, and in, in the rest of Asia that could actually, what, should be seeking a return. And of course, if we had um, a, a financial mechanism for the, to get them to get that return out of infrastructure, that might be able to help. At the moment, the role of infrastructure funding seems to all come down to government. And I think there are better ways to be able to provide that. Um, I, I, and I think that is, but I hope that it is a part of the Murray Review that's, that's being put together at the moment. More questions? Yes? Yeah, uh, how do you think that the, uh, the trend, that, how do you think that the Asia buying up assets in Australia and the outsourcing of Australian jobs will affect um, the economy? Do you think it will have a significant effect on economic productivity? Look, I, I mean, the way I look at this is Australia is already a very open economy. A very open economy in the scheme of things. Um, we're a large, we have a large trading relationship and we have fairly low tariff barriers. But in terms of financial flows, think about it this way. Our Australian government bonds, um, which is actually a key reason why I end up spending a lot of my time travelling internationally, are 70% foreign owned. Okay? So our financial market is very open and the rest of the world is very aware of exactly how open we are, how deep and liquid our markets are, 
and, 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 and the fact that they can access our markets quickly. We have the fourth most traded currency pair in the world. The Aussie dollar, US dollar cross is the fourth most traded pair, even though, as I said earlier, we're the 12th largest economy and 1% and, and, and of global GDP. So there's an awareness that we are a very open economy. We're also a very open economy ac across another aspect, and that is 28% of our population was born somewhere else. So I think in, in having an open economy, in having an open financial system, and having a market that really does get set by a market, a market where, where, where competition and, and, the, and the market determines pricing within the economy, you have to also accept, in large part, that capital can flow from abroad into the Australian economy and capital can flow offshore as well. And that's what we're seeing. We have a very open economy, capital does flow in. And I think you might be referring to the amount of capital that's flowing from China at the moment, particularly into Australia's housing market. I think that's, I still think that's an, overall, it's a positive story that we have a market that is open enough to allow capital to flow from abroad. It's saving from abroad, that's looking for investment opportunities in Australia. That is overall a positive story. I think there's also a sense that this idea that Chinese capital flowing into the Australian housing market is crowding out Australians out of, out of our own housing market is over, overblown. There aren't very good estimates of this, I must say. I mean, even the RBA has said there just aren't very good estimates of this. But from everything you can work out from the statistics, this is a very small story. It's, it's on the margin. Um, if a foreign national wants to buy a house in Australia, a true foreign national, not someone who holds an Australian visa, they have to go through the Foreign Investment Review Board. And the Foreign Investment Review Board needs to give approval, and then each year they publish how many approvals they've given. Last year they gave 12,000 approvals. Housing turnover in Australia is somewhere between 450 and 500,000, so that tells you that actually about two, one to two percent of turnover is from true foreign nationals. Now I know there's a whole lot of other stories and that's why it's complicated because actually what happens is a lot of capital flows over here and, and the purchases are made in the, whole, in, in the name of a, a visa holder, maybe a student visa holder and they're a foreign national but they've got a student visa and they don't need to get approval. So there's a lot more ways that capital can flow here. But in, the, in general I just don't think this is something one, we, should, we, we can control particularly or two, we ought to be trying to control. If you want to deal with affordability issues in the housing market, I think the simplest, one simple way to do this, and this is the clearest way, and that is reduce the regulations within the states for land release and for in urban infill, and that will allow the supply side to adjust. And as supply adjusts within our cities and there are more houses built, that will help to rebalance what's happening with house prices. I, don't, I think the main issue here is essentially that we haven't got enough houses for the amount of demand that exists, and the way you do that is you deregulate so that there are more houses brought online. Are there more questions? Um, I'll go here. Yeah. And what's your view on the future of manufacturing? Pessimistic. <laughs> um, I like to put this chart up. I didn't use it, so it's one that I can actually use to show this point. Okay. This is gross value added across the three Australian economies. So it's GDP, yeah, ostensibly, by industry. So broken up by industry. And I've got it right back to 1900. I like my long run big picture stories. So this is back to 1900. There's a few things you can draw out of this. And I'll just go quickly through the other things. And that is mining, the red line, is, used to be about 5% of the economy. It's ramped up now, it's about 10% of the economy. Worth keeping in mind that mining is only 10% of the economy. For all the attention it gets, and the fact that, of course, it's been growing very quickly, it may deservedly gets that attention, it is only 10% of the economy. Agriculture used to be 30% of the economy, now it's only two. So keep in mind, even though agriculture, I'm optimistic about agriculture, it's actually a small portion of the overall story. But the question was the manufacturing industry. The manufacturing industry used to be 25% of our economy back in the 1960s. Okay? But it's been, on a decline, it's been a declining share of the economy now since the 1960s. And indeed now, it's about 6.5% of our overall economy. This picture is very similar to the rest of the developed world. There are very few countries where you've seen uh, manufact developed countries where the manufacturing industry has been rising as a share of the economy. And it's not a consequence of the high Aussie dollar. It's a consequence of globalization. The world has opened up. And so global, global participants have said, well, where are the, where's the best place for our manufacturing plants to be? Well, it's where the labour is cheapest and where the, where the economy is, is fairly open. And that turns out to be the range of economies that have entered the world in the last 30 years, the Eastern Europe, but most importantly, Asia and China in particular. So manufacturing has been moving to where the labour is cheapest. Australia is not that place. We don't have uh, cheap labour, we don't have a low cost, we're not a low cost country. Um, we can't compete in low cost manufacturing. We shouldn't be making motor vehicles because we can't compete in that environment. And in fact, <laughs> you can now ask 
the major motor vehicle in, in, in manufacturers who are currently withdrawing, whether they can compete in the international environment, and they flatly tell you on the front, that gets reported on the front page of the AFR that they can't. They say they can't compete. So it's, it, we can't have it. We just can't have a competitive, low-cost manufacturing industry. I think there are some opportunities within manufacturing that are high-value-added. Uh, very precise type things. For example, I think the Governor of the Reserve Bank just recently referred to the fact that Boeing has a factory, uh, buys its ailerons from a, a small operation in Melbourne that produces these things. That's an example of something we can do. Uh, the mining industry has some spin-offs as well. There's engineering services companies that manufacture things that are very specific to the mining industry. And they're in high demand because we're a global leader in that area. These are the sorts of things that we can manufacture. Wine is a manufactured good, and I think you guys are pretty good at doing that. I certainly enjoyed some of it last night. So I think you know if you can, if we can do things that you can compete in, um, if, if you've got where, where you've got a comparative advantage, then we ought to. But we ought not protect industries that we can't compete in in the medium term. And low-cost manufacturing is one I think that is going to continue to shrink, as it probably should. We should shift to the things we are better at doing. Um, I, I'm, I'm conscious that I'm almost out of time. Time? Okay. So I'll call time. Thank you. Uh, one more question. I'll make my answer quick. I know I'm the, I'm the one who makes these questions more drawn out because I give you five minute answers. I was just wondering, with the current government uh, fiscal deficit, how much longer do you believe that would last for? Yeah, I didn't get a chance to talk about fiscal policy, and unfortunately, I've got lots of answers to that question. Um, the um, so I'm going to try and do a very quick version of this story. Okay, the quick version of the story is this. We have a fiscal deficit, absolutely, and it would be much better right now if we didn't. We've just come through a mining investment boom, and it would be, it would be, you know, we've come to the end of an extraordinary period in Australia's history, biggest run up in our terms of trade, very beneficial period for, for GDP growth, and we've got a fiscal deficit at the end. So we should be in better shape, absolutely, but you have to put it in context. Our fiscal position is better than almost any other country in the world, almost. So this is a chart of net debt across the set of advanced economies, the OECD economies. We're a sixth from the left. There are a range of countries that have done a bit better than us, but in the scheme of things, we have fairly low levels of government debt. There's another myth that I would like to squash, and that is that Australia is a high spending government. Um, this is a chart on a similar sort of basis, a whole range of countries across the OECD economies, and it, the red bars show government expenditure as a share of GDP. We have a very low level of government expenditure compared to this range of economies. Now, I'm not telling you we should aspire to be like these other economies. We should have European levels of spending. That's not a good idea. This is one of the challenges that they face. But it's not as though we're in really bad shape. So my answer to you is, I think the government needs to make some plans to make sure that in the medium term we get back to budget surplus. I don't think we need to deliver this this year. And in fact, this year is not the best of years to do it. Because as I said at the beginning, or at least the first slide said, Australia's economy is expected to be a bit below average this year. We're still in second year. We're coming to the end of this mining story. So I don't think we ought to deliver a bit budget surplus immediately. We need to make plans to get there over the next few years. But this idea that we've got a budget crisis that needs fixing is, I think, a myth. I don't think Australia has a budget crisis. We've got fairly low levels of government debt. We've got a AAA rating. And actually, as a proportion of the overall economy, government spending is fairly small in the scheme of things. I hope that's helpful. That's it for me. Cheers. <laughs>